Well, welcome. This is Dada, and uh, my presentation was going to say that his this book is talking about all the how global capitalism has been destroying our lives, our economies, our communities, and the world, and the planet. So he's been staying in Venezuela for the past five, six years, mm -hmm. and um, he's been seeing like the growth of like the uh, what is it, uh, like the communities and economic growth from like. Uh, grassroots mm -hmm. uh, from people up, so he's here to present us. Great! Ta -da. Ta -da. So many people think I come from planet Jupiter, so I really appreciate that kind of an introduction. Terrifying. <laughs> um, can you see this is okay? The lighting's okay? So my story, um, briefly. I, uh, 1971, I went to college, a little college called Earlham in Indiana. And it was a confusing time because there's this war, it's the Vietnam War, it's going on in my name. The more I read about it, the more I don't agree with it. I became a conscientious objector. Then a month later, I changed my mind and decided to burn my draft card. I wrote a letter to the government selective service office, told them I'd broken the law and I'm not gonna cooperate anymore. But at that time, half a million people were doing the same thing, and so they didn't prosecute me. This poster, or a poster like this, hung on my dorm wall. At the risk of sounding ridiculous, I would say the true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love. I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be a revolutionary, but I want to have love. Shortly after that, I learned yoga and meditation as a hobby. And I found, surprisingly, more happiness and more peace than I ever thought possible. So at age 24, I went to India to meet the founder of this yoga. Who is this guy? Very interesting gentleman, Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar. Welcome. My first meeting with him took place in his prison cell. Because for seven years, he was a political prisoner because of his stand against corruption, against the exploitation of the caste system, and the exploitation of women, all very serious problems in India. He's an extremely intelligent person, and yet very, very humble, and extremely loving. I never met anybody who seemed to have so much unconditional love. So he inspired me to become a monk. And this color orange that I wear means it's my favorite color, yes, but it also means that my life is dedicated to humanity, the service of humanity. He also founded this model, the progressive utilization theory, which is based on economic self-reliance of every region, community, cooperatives, environmental balance, and universal spiritual values. I'm going to talk briefly about these tonight. Um, so for the last 35 years, I've been working in Southeast Asia, Brazil, and Venezuela. Um, but always I consider myself a revolutionary monk. Sarkar said there's three ways to respond to exploitation or injustice. First way is silence. I don't want to get in trouble, I'm afraid, or I don't want to lose my privileges, so I'm not going to say anything about it. Second way to respond, of course, is to try to gradually reform things, to change the laws. The only problem with this is the gradual part. There's a risk that everybody you want to help may be dead, by the time the laws change. So the third way, of course, is a revolutionary response. And this Sarkar clearly put himself as a revolutionary, and I consider myself the same. And I don't want to embarrass myself, so I'm going to turn my <laughs> ringer off now, OK? <laughs> What is economic democracy and why do we need it? You guys know why we need it. But... No, I, uh, I always start with this question, what kind of world do we want? Actually, I mean, I think it's the most important question of all. 
Uh, I wish we would ask it from kindergarten to postgraduate level every year of school and very seriously consider the answers. Um, but tonight, could we just go around the room and please give your name and one part, one sentence, one word, one phrase of part of your hopes for a better world. Do you mind? I'm Betty Rainbow Hoover. I use uh, Gandhi's Be the Peace You Want to See in the World as kind of my mantra. Thank you. Uh, Jerry writes it in Baltimore. Um, uh, I'd like to see a sacred world. Thank you. In the Philippines, in Argentina, in Poland, always the answers are the same. A world with no hunger, no war, no poverty, protecting nature, more justice, equality, and a world of peace for everybody. I think global capitalism is going to end. You know, there have been something like 77 empires in human history. Um, historians kind of, you know, they're not quite sure which ones are or not, but around 77 they all agree. And uh, it's interesting, only one still exists, the U.S. empire, and I don't think it'll last forever. The contradictions are amazing, you know. 22 empty houses in this country for every homeless. I mean, it's really true, you know. I mean, 842,000 homeless in any given week, you know, because always somebody's losing a job and suddenly, and somebody else gets a job, and you know, so I mean, constant the flux is there, but, and 22 houses for every one of them. I mean, just astonishing. So the movie they're coming out of is called The Economy. The people on the left are really happy because it was great for them, and the people coming out on the right are really unhappy because it didn't work for them. Whereas the artist said in Australia, every morning she said, I wake up on the wrong side of capitalism. <laughs> this, uh, I think you, uh, you've seen the latest video that came out probably, but just, you know, what people think would be the ideal division between the bottom, you know, each of the 20% uh, of the population, you know, and the actual distribution of wealth is all on the top, you know, 20%, 40%, and everybody else is like nothing. So the distribution, the inequality of America is astonishing, of course. You all know the name Frank Luntz. Uh, you all know the name George Orwell. Remember him? Right. So it's kind of the same guy, right? So for example, instead of saying fracking, he says energy exploration. Doesn't that sound better than fracking, right? You know, it sounds nice, right? And of course, he says that, uh, you know, instead of health care reform, say government takeover. That sounds bad, right? And estate tax, of course. He's the one who's teaching all these terms, so all the Republicans <coughs> unanimously are using the same terms. Waste is, of course, government spending. Now, he says, after Michael Moore's movie came out, you know, really can't use the word capitalism anymore, you know? So avoid it. Don't ever say capitalist or capitalism, say job creator. Doesn't that sound good, right, you know? Exploiter, no. Job creator, sounds good, right? Uh, pay for performance, CEO bonuses, even when the company's crashing, no problem. Pay for performance, right? And economic freedom is for global capitalism. Interesting because freedom is, you know, such a wonderful word, a human right, right? And economic freedom, of course, means the right to amass wealth and take it out of other people's pockets. It's amazing. So anyway, I interviewed Noam Chomsky for this book. Um, I got the Occupy Wall Street film crew to come up to MIT with me. And he said, you can't have <laughs> meaningful political democracy without functioning economic democracy. An economy of, by, and for the people. So the first principle is just what you guys were saying, the right to live. We have to guarantee food, clothing, shelter, education, medical care to everyone. Drinking water, of course, part of food. It's the right to live, obviously. And instead of just giving it to everybody who doesn't have it, 
is you guarantee a job with fair wages? We have so much work in this country that needs doing. We have so many people who need work. We just put the two together. There are basically three ways to own a company, an enterprise, right? And it's interesting that both capitalism and communist governments have been traditionally very dogmatic about it. Capitalism saying you should privatize everything as far as possible. And communist governments have traditionally said as far as possible, everything should be state owned. And of course, they're both leaving out the cooperative ownership, the third way to run an enterprise. In economic democracy, Proud says actually all three work in different situations. The small scale, no problem. Let individuals, let partnerships, families start private enterprises. Allow that initiative, that inventiveness, you know, the creativity of the small scale. Capitalism works in the small scale. Then you have, of course, cooperatives, which are more democratic. Everybody owns the enterprise. And finally, you have strategic key industries like the State Bank of North Dakota, the only state-owned bank in the country. You know, all the profits that come in, they don't go to any investors' pockets. They circulate. They reinvest in new loans so that, you know, they help the people. So public utilities never privatized. This is just a general graph, you know, but on the average, you know, when you buy locally, local enterprises in a cooperative, you know, most of your money stays in the local economy. And when you buy in big box stores, you know, most of your money leaves the local economy. So quickly, uh, Latin America. I, <clears throat> I've lived there for about 20 years. In the last six or seven years, I've been in Venezuela. Hugo Chavez came to power, of course. He's using petroleum money that the country gets to its national petroleum company. It was nationalized before he came to power for the people. So for the first time, it's for everyone. Yeah. Venezuela is for everyone. So there's free food, um, free lunch program in all the schools for all the kids, right? Breakfast, lunch, merienda, um, free health care. One day, I ate some bad yogurts. I got dizzy, you know, vomiting. Didn't know what it was. I went to the clinic. They said, it's probably just, you know, something you ate. But just to make sure, better come back tomorrow for a free MRI. Of course, it's free. I'm not a citizen yet. It's free for everybody. Um, uh, Chavez reduced poverty by 50% and extreme poverty by 70% while he was in office, which is very significant. And at the same time, since the last 10 years, the economy's been growing on average 4.3%. It was 5% last year. So, I mean, actually, there are jobs. Unemployment is down to 7% now. So it's 7 point, some, I'm sorry, 7.5 or something last year. So it's, it's a, a significant reduction of poverty and at the same time significant growth of the economy. There are 66,000 functioning cooperatives in Venezuela. This is a documentary that our institute made called Another Life is Possible. We interviewed cooperatives in Barlavento. Barlavento is Estado Miranda, you know. It's two hours out of Caracas and it's all Afro-Venezuelan population, 95% in that particular region, right? With poverty, history of racism, discrimination, descendants of former slaves, of course. So we interviewed 50 cooperatives, all sectors, right? Agriculture cooperatives, bus drivers cooperatives, taxi drivers cooperatives, uh, restaurant, hotel, fishermen cooperatives, all kinds. Almost all with low levels of education, right? Um, low levels of skills, right? Um, women said, you know, never before in our lives have we ever gotten a salary. This is the first time. It was 150 working in one tailor cooperative. Fantastic. They're making uniforms. We met men who said, first time in our lives we were ever our own boss. We like this. So it's a very empowering process. Community empowerment, 33,000 communal councils. These are groups of 400 families or less, usually around 400 families. They meet together 
they list all the problems their community has and they prioritize them. At least 50% of the 400 families have to be present, representatives have to be present when they decide by consensus or voting what are the top two. They write project proposals for the top two, give it to the government, and basically they're all accepted. A billion, so they're getting between five and $20,000 to do what they want. Nobody's telling them what they should be doing. They decide what, they, so that's community empowerment, right? I live, our house is located in a zone of upper middle class houses and almost all the people, guess what, are at the Chavista, okay? They have a communal council too. We decide what we want, <laughs> we get the money, you know? It doesn't matter what your political persuasion is. Everybody gets this community empowerment process and it goes to a cooperative bank of the community, of the communal council. So it's 33,000, it's a powerful process. This is the most popular t-shirt after Chavez died. When Chavez died, um, <laughs> I wanted to say thank you, I wanted to say goodbye. So I called a friend at the radio station and said, what are the plans? When the plans were finally announced late at night, he called me back and said they're going to bring the body from the hospital where he was to the National Military Base for viewing. So I, five of my friends came with me and we all went to the base at 6 a.m. in the morning. The guard says he's not coming till afternoon. We said, this is Venezuela, I think we'll wait. <laughs> by, six, by 7 o'clock in the morning, after an hour, there were 200 of us waiting. By 8 o'clock, we're 1,500, they finally let us in. By noon time, the 50,000 stadium is full. And this was the most popular t-shirt. I am Chavez. We are Chavez. Fascinating. And an awful lot of women. Chavez really managed to empower women. I met women in Vargas, in the hills of Vargas, right? They said, we were so poor, whenever anybody got sick, they died. It took us two days, and no money at all, to carry the body down to the cemetery, and sometimes when we got back, there's another body waiting to go. That's how bad it was. Now we have a clinic in every one of our villages, and not only that, the Ban Mujer, the Women's Bank, Nora Castaneda is the director, she, the Women's Bank gave us loans to start cooperatives in our fields. Now we have money, we can get the produce to the market, we can get good money for it, we're all getting good salaries, we're never going back. Viva Chavez. Sicosa Sola is an old cooperative. It's been around for 46 years. I'm sorry, 48 years now. And uh, it's in Barquisimeto, Venezuela. Okay. Four days a week, 450 tons of produce, and 55,000 families are shopping there every week. They have annual sales of $100 million. I just came from Roanoke, Virginia, food co-op, very nice food co-op, okay? Been serving the community more than 10 years. They're getting close to $5 million in annual sales. This has $100 million. It's big. 1,200 workers. It's a whole network of cooperatives. It originally stood for, you know, for the state of Lada, but actually they're working in five states now, so it's kind of it's an obsolete name, but everybody knows that they keep the name. They built an entire hospital, cooperative hospital. One of the most successful things is the funeral service. For poor people, when somebody dies, it's a big hit, you know? They want to honor, respect their grandmother, grandfather, but they can't afford it. They go into badly debt. So this funeral service, you pay $1.50, slightly less, every month. You and eight members of your immediate family are all covered if anybody dies. You get full funeral service, you don't pay a penny more. Full coffin, funeral, burial, uh, uh, cremation, whatever you want. But with workers who really are dignified, really respect you, they really give a good job. 30,000 people have belonged to this funeral cooperative. It's fantastic. Many small, they're, they're constantly starting up 
new cooperatives, women, men, uh, families get together, they make jellies, jams, pastas, soaps, shampoos, anything. But they're producing them and then they're sold in the same big food. So it's really nice. It's, it's giving more and more jobs to more and more people. Of course, the take, you know, about this, um, the takeovers of factories when the IMF was, when Argentine economy was crashing, uh, the workers started taking over their own factories. So it's now 250 worker takeovers, 13,000 people, and only two have failed. That's a pretty good success rate. In Brazil, it's now 174 worker managed takeovers that are running as cooperatives. These are all cooperative management, okay? The workers run the factories themselves when it's going bankrupt. Noam Chomsky, when I'm interviewing him, he says, this is the next strategy for occupying his opinion. When a factory closes down, the whole community comes, the workers come, and they say, no, we're not closing down, the workers are taking it over. Another form of occupancy. This is from the Philippines. It's a painting that I happen to love, okay? It's called Bayanihan. In Filipino language, that means you move a house. Literally, when the water rises, you know, and it's, you know, they sometimes have to move a house. Um, but they all do it together. Today, most Filipino kids have never seen this, but every child in Philippines knows that word Bayanihan. It means we all work together. We all move together. I think moral leadership is very important. And what I really mean is setting an example. Not being afraid to set a positive example and inspire people to join you. Anybody, and I repeat that, anyone can become, like Rigoberto Manchu from Guatemala, of course, indigenous woman, won the Nobel Peace Prize. This woman I know personally, Marina Silva, illiterate until the age of 11. Robert Tapper's daughter in the Amazon. She started working with Chico Mendez before he died, They're trying to save the Amazon and mobilize the workers, the residents of the Amazon rainforest, to save the forest. She became environment minister, very powerful speaker. With the landless people's movement, I've met people who never went to school in their life, but they walk their talk. When they speak, everybody listens because they're living it, you understand? So that's what I mean by leaders, okay? I'm talking about anybody who's willing, like you're cooperative, you set an example. And you say, come on, let's do it. So I met Chavez 10 years ago when I wrote my first book. It was published in Spanish, and I gave it to him. And because of a friend of a friend, I got invited to his national television show, Allo Presidente. It's no big deal, really. There were 150 guests that day. It's every week. It goes on for five hours. I had about two minutes. No big deal. But what he said to me was, thank you very much, brother. Oh, you had a preface by Noam Chomsky. We like this very much. You're Fray Beto from Brazil. We like him very much. You know, he's talking about what he sees in the book, you know. He said, oh, about agriculture cooperatives. Hey, Afrin. Afrin was the agriculture minister at that time. He changes all the time. Afrin, you got a copy. I say, you open your copy to page 126. It says right here, agriculture cooperatives. That's exactly what we're trying to do. So he said, thank you, brother. And let's continue with spirituality, spirit, good faith, morality, and the mystical force that guides the world. I thought, I like that. <laughs> I think there is a mystical force that's guiding us, okay? Doesn't matter, but I personally, I like that. And he said, you're welcome, brother. You and everyone who dreams for a better world, that means all of you, right? Who dreams for a better world, you're welcome, just as it says in this book. So, I went back there. 2007, finally I managed to get enough donations, and we started this Prout Research Institute of Venezuela. Independent, not-for-profit foundation. We've had over 40 volunteers so far from so many different countries. Um, we usually have 10 people in our house, half are Venezuelans, half are people from other countries, and um, this is what we're doing. This is a big house. We happen to have the use of forever. Uh, 
you can't quite see how big it is, but on the ground floor, which is invisible behind the railing, is our offices, kitchen, dining rooms. Uh, residences for all the males are here, and females and families are up on top. We have a huge yoga room on the top floor. We have seven bathrooms. In addition to us ten, we have bunk beds for 40 visitors. We have 40 visitors at a time. So we serve really nice vegetarian food, and you're all invited to come down. <laughs> we give training courses about economic democracy and cooperativism, right? This is what I say every morning, I wake up in paradise. It's fantastic. We have, but it's not easy if you go there. We have eight mango trees, and of course papaya trees, banana trees, lemon trees, chico trees, guanabana trees, guava trees. So I'm sorry guys, but if you come, you know, it's, if it's during mango season, you have to go out in the morning, pick up 40 ripe mangoes, cut them up, blend them up, drink it, and go out in the afternoon and do it all over again. So I mean, don't expect the meditation for your own peace. It's optional, of course. This is a center two hours out of Caracas in that zone Barlavento I was telling you about, Afro-Venezuelan. Didi Nandasana from the Netherlands started it. It's a women's run project. And this is her board. And she always uses the word rescatar. Yes. Rescatar means to rescue, right? So to rescue the self-esteem of the women, the teenagers, the children, the people of these communities. Um, so she has a lot of programs, workshops. She started children's libraries and teenage, you know, young people's libraries. They, they go literally to every house with kids and they lend books and trade what they had before on one condition that the mother, father, or older sibling has to read the stories to the kids every night. It's working. The teachers love it in the schools. They say the kids love to read now for the first time. They love it. And the parents report that every night the kids are falling asleep with books lying on top of their bodies. <laughs> and it's, and then after two years, we, they did a survey of all the mothers in, in, who had children. And they asked them some questions. And one of the questions, did anybody ever read to you when you were a kid? Zero. Not one. And all those families are getting this culture. And Chavez, he always promoted books. He always, Even when he went to the United Nations, he held up Noam Chomsky's book, you remember. He's always holding up books. It's not just that day. It's every day. Um, they got a, this is a national model of small scale sustainable agriculture, according to the Ministry of Agriculture. They have only seven acres of land, seven acres, very small, and yet they're producing so much food. So they're getting 100 visitors a week to buy the food, to learn what they're doing. They're making all these guava tree seedlings. Uh, the students from the agriculture university are coming to learn. And it's all based on this idea of what we call neo-humanism. Neo-humanism is what you were saying about animals and plants. First, that all human beings are part of our human family, but also the animals, the plants, the nature, the animate and inanimate, everything. It's all our family. We're all connected. So we have a school in Caracas, a preschool with 40 kids, lovely, learning that you have a potential physical, mental, and spiritual more than you can imagine, let's develop it. So, in the United States, I'm not an expert about your country, but I'm going to tell you a few things. Oh, I should say one more thing, I'm sorry, about Venezuela. There are problems in Venezuela, okay? I mean, I really believe what Chavez has done is a good thing, and there are mistakes, okay? In my opinion, one of the things I disagree with Chavez the most was his mouth. He tended to always use insulting rhetoric. And I think nonviolent communication is where you respectfully, you know, address people, and he always insulted the opposition. He felt it was called for, I disagree. But it means there's a lot of polarization. People love him or hate him, and that's a problem. You need to dialogue and you need to unite the people. 
crime is a problem, corruption is a problem. So I'm just mentioning this, okay? I mean, I want you to come down, but it's, you know, okay. So, nothing is perfect. What? Nobody's perfect, <laughs> nothing is perfect. I know that, I'm just mentioning. Welcome Don't think. The minimum wage in this country, I believe, is seven dollars and twenty-five cents. Right? It's not a living wage, is it, guys? I mean, obviously. So, is there a maximum wage in this country? Actually, there is. A starting federal worker gets seventeen thousand six hundred and something dollars any starting federal worker in this country. And if you work in the government and you get up to the top paying job, president, right, senator, Supreme Court judge, five-star general, you get only 10 times what the starting salary is. You're getting a salary of $176,000. It's very clear. You can find on the internet all these pay scales. And every state government's the same, every city government's the same, and nobody accuses the city, state, or federal government of being communist. <laughs> you know, just because they have a maximum ceiling of wealth. So my question is, why don't we have seven oh there are the numbers. Seventy thousand eight hundred and three dollars starting salary and hundred and seventy nine thousand. That's ten times, right? Norway, of course, has only five times gap between the richest and the poor. Ever, nobody thinks that's unjust. That's one of the best economies in Europe, you know. And 5.3 times, that's fine, fair. So I'm just pointing out that maybe radically we could have a cap on wealth in this country. I know it's pretty radical. Cooperatives, there are now 30,000 cooperatives in the United States. They create two million jobs. Do you hear the statistics every day? I mean, so one billion people are members of cooperatives in the world. Co-ops in the world are 100 million jobs, which is 20% more than all the multinational corporations put together, right? And cooperatives are much more likely to succeed because private businesses at least are failing at 40% in the first year and 60% by the fifth year. It's hard to get these statistics. They really don't want you to know how much the failure rate is. You know, I got a friend now who's using the Scholar, Google Scholar, and, 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 the, and the, line, the university to try to find out better statistics because they don't announce it. So my question is, why don't we hear these statistics on the CNN business news or anything else business news? <laughs> why not? Anyone? Because they, want, they don't want us to hear them. Okay, what else? Well, they're ins insulating themselves from the pop from popular pressure to speak people right. love and they'll say, this is screwed up, why don't we change right. it? Right. Anything else? Well, if they just talk about the com private companies, then people will, a lot of people will believe that only those companies exist. And right. Not, like, and all these cooperatives are invisible. Um, I just, uh, all three of the other answers use they. And I want to clarify what that they is, and that they is that 20% of, or probably even like the top 10% of the Actually one-tenth of 1%, one but yes, I, I get the picture. Right, right. so that, that the business owners and the media owners are the same. Right. Everybody is, they all right. have the same yacht clubs, right. and it's really important for the business owners that the media owners right. say that they're doing the things. Absolutely. Also, you know, the business news is for who? Bosses. Job creators. And investors. Yeah, exactly. Job creators, you got it. Job creators. Job creators. Job Investors. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they even point out that, uh, what do you call, um, you know, for, 40 years ago, it was totally different because 40 years ago, the richest people in this country, they kept investing their money in something productive. Start a new company, a new factory, buy new land, start new farms, whatever. But they keep. But now, 99% of the investments are speculation, right? So I mean, it's really not. The money's not rolling. It's just you know getting like 
not like this, of course, they're up on the moon. But anyway, you can understand the point. <laughs> so anyway, cooperatives are totally boring for investors, for job creators, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're totally boring because you can't own them. You can give them a loan, they'll pay you back with interest gradually, but that's boring. You know, you can't buy it, you can't sell it, you can't break it up, you know, you can't control it. You can't control it, that's a good one. Yeah, they can't control it, so that's why they're not interested. Just ignore them, you know, they're totally uninteresting. So, question, why don't people cooperate more of the time? For uh, I was just going to say, going back to what I said earlier, a lot of people don't know that there's another way of doing things. Right. So it's just kind of like you're stuck in this sure. like, way of thinking and sure. how you see the world. Sure. You got it? Uh, for, no, sorry, I lost it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, Anyone else? <laughs> Why don't we cooperate more of the time? Any other reasons? We're taught to be competitive. Competitive? Competitive financial system right. built on scarcity. Right. Competitive. Anyone else? Um, yes. No time. Too much work. Too much work. No time. Okay. Also distracted with mm -hmm. nonsense like, you know, what Brad Pitt's latest outfit is or something like that. What is it? Can you I'm tell not me? Sure. <laughs> yes. We live in a society that's out for the individual. Individualistic. We've got to talk to cooperate. Right. Right. Education too, right? Anyone else? I think it's part of it is greed. It's just this idea that if this is going to be successful, I want as much for it for me as I can. Why should I share, you know, a piece of Facebook or Google or something that's going to be worth billions? I could be worth billions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All good answers, and of course. They're all interconnected, right? Just this briefly, um, you know, survival of the fittest was never said by Jar Charles Darwin. Survival of the fittest was created by this man, Herbert right. Spencer, who, uh, a contemporary, Victorian, British, right? He applied the evolutionary, the, the biological theory of evolution to society. And this was great for British imperialism because he said the strong should rule. So perfect justification for, for England to go on invading every country for the US, very popular in the US, and in Germany. First World War, Second World War, we can see why. The strong should rule. It's perfect justification for Nazism, right? Yeah, we can invade any other country because we're the strongest, we're the best, we're the most. I'm going to come back to this theory in a minute, OK? I think it still exists, this idea. Uh, the scientific view is another reason, and they're interconnected, right? 1960, this Austrian anthropologist, Conrad Lorenz, comes out with this book on aggression, saying that human beings are fundamentally, by nature, violent, aggressive, competitive, right? And 10 years later, Richard Dawkins, still very famous biologist, right? Selfish gene says we're basically selfish by nature, competitive, selfish. So these, you know, Hollywood takes these ideas and says, dog eat dog world, the best man wins, every man for himself, king of the mountain, all these, I'm, uh, I'm using male terms because that's what they use, right? But all these ideas that uh, selfishness and greed, <laughs> what a reality show. Why can't everybody win on a reality show? I never watched it, but no, right? You can't. You have to stab the, your, the partner in the back, right? If you want to win, you have to. You have to cutthroat. They want it. Isn't that exciting to watch you stab your neighbor in the back, you know? You play together and then, then you cheat on him. Ah, ha, ha, isn't that cool, you know? That's cheating your wife, cheating your husband. I mean, always this is the very exciting theme, yes. Well, that's encouraged, like, in corporations. If you've ever seen the movie, the Enron movie. Right, Enron, yeah. yeah. Right. The, 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 you know, just cutthroat is, is, an, is a culture that's encouraged. So, back to social Darwinism, you know, that the strong should rule, the biggest, too big to fail, remember that? Where does that come from? The 10 biggest banks, right, are bailed out the same year, 150 small and medium banks fail. Okay, the money's, the, the federal is 
insuring the deposits, right? But why are they not bailing out the small guys? Because this theory that you know these are the big guys, they're the most important, and the other ones really don't matter, right? They go bankrupt, all the employees lose their jobs, no big deal, right? So what can we do to inspire people to cooperate more? Another question? I should have warned you at the beginning. I have a lot of questions for you guys, OK? <laughs> what can we do to inspire people to cooperate more? By example, and cooperate with people. That's great. Set an example. Well, education. Education again. And I'm just thinking this this slide before, mm -hmm. uh, that too big to feel things. Does that, does that kind of come out of the, the Reagan trickle down kind of thing, that if they fail, then the things Everyone's probably, but I don't know. Yes, probably very much related. I mean, they've been keeping these ideas for a long time. Anyone else? What can we do to cooperate more? Well, showing people that it's in their best interest. Those the sort of statistics about cooperative businesses, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. showing people that they are less likely to fail, more mm -hmm. likely to succeed if they work together with other right. people. That would be impressive, be yes. Yes, yes. I just had a question. Um, I was thinking back about this. You showed about two million jobs are, are provided by farmers in this country. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Does that include like companies that do profit sharing, like uh, stock options and things like that? No. This is cooperative, but it includes credit unions. Not two, but I'm sorry, jobs, jobs. So the members are much more right, in credit unions, and the jobs are just a few. Now, it includes the, the big guys, the agriculture co-ops, okay, the, 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 you know, the support big, big agriculture. But those are the statistics in the latest Yes magazine about cooperatives. What's the difference between a, a, a corporation that, that offers profit sharing and a co-op? Offers profit sharing? I mean, stock employee option plans usually use 10% or 20% of the profits for all the workers. So yes, there's an incentive, but it's not 100%. It's just 20%. That's my yes? Yeah, we. Um, this is a collective run business, which I think could count under that. Um, and we looked into some um, models. Uh, yeah, models of, of stock stuff, so I can answer that a little bit, um, which is that um, in a worker cooperative, the workers make all of the decisions, and um, they may decide to sell out a small portion of those decisions in the form of stock, but that's a small portion, and it's not going to be like a make or break on the decision, whereas in a corporation, the CEO and CFO and whatever make all the decisions, and they may decide to sell out a small portion of their decisions, but if um, you own a stock in a company and everybody who owns stock in that company agrees that they should stop doing something, they still may not, they don't have to. They may succumb to the pressure, but they don't have to. Whereas um, at Emma's, if the workers want to do something and we sell out a couple of shares of stock and the investors don't want it, they can't stop us because we're the workers and we're the owners and we control it. Well, it, uh, the way a corporation is supposed to work, it's supposed to have the shareholders come together and they like to make decisions for the company. And that includes appointing the CEO. So I was just, I've seen with Apple and many other corporations. <laughs> the shareholders can do whatever they want with the CEO. They can keep them or lose them. So I'm still trying to understand the difference between... Well, once upon a time, that was the way it worked. But now with investment funds, and I forget what they're all called, but these individuals control so many, because when you, when you put your retirement money into one of these investment funds, that person who controls that fund has tremendous economic clout. So they own so many shares of every corporation that they have tremendous um, control. They can tell exactly who you should do, what you should do. You can't do this. You have to do this to make the maximum profits every three months or we're pulling all our stock out of your corporation. So this is what's changed in recently because of this, these hedge funds and all these big guys. 
Anyway, uh, this is what I do. I teach cooperative games. I think games are a good way to teach cooperation. So in this game, everybody's sitting in a circle and they're giving a back massage to the person in front of them. It feels very good. It teaches cooperation. You know the game Musical Chairs, you remember? Right, you play the music, everybody sits down, oh, somebody doesn't have a seat, so they're out, and gradually you have a winner. 24 adults, all sitting on one chair. <laughs> Cooperative, just nobody's out, the same game. You don't tell them how to do it, that's a problem. You solve it, guys, it's a cooperative problem. They all start laughing immediately. They all start saying, well, I'm bigger than you are, so I'll sit down and you sit on me, you know, and this is what they come up with. I create a solution to an unusual problem. 24 adults sitting on one chair and having a wonderful, happy time doing it, right? Community. You can levitate, you know, the yogi said you can levitate. Well, I teach levitation all the time, but, you know, in a group. And you can even fly, right, which is how dramatic press jump. And you can't do it too high, but I mean, it takes, it takes an hour and a half to work with a group and gradually get up to this level of safety and all this thing, step by step, right? But it's a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> Advertising for beginners, you know this, right? Look, honey, I bought something today. Oh, darling, I'm so proud of you. What did he buy? Doesn't matter. It can be a car. A pair of shoes, a Coca-Cola, look at the happiness in their faces. This is eternal happiness forever if you buy this Coca-Cola, right? It's a lie, isn't it? I mean, doesn't happiness come from your heart? From love? Or, as the wall says, the best things in life aren't things? I just heard somebody say, anyway, I've got to find the quote, the source of this quote originally. Yeah. So, Prout, the economic democracy, are proposing an ecological and spiritual perspective that actually both capitalism and traditionally communism have lacked. The indigenous people had this. Marx started studying indigenous people the last years of his life, actually, in his writings. And I think it's very powerful, you know, the, the, the thought not that I own the land, I belong to the land. I'm part of it. So, I clarify, I do not believe in dogma fundamentalism, which is closed-minded, blind obedience, instilling fear in people, and worst of all, dividing people between us and them. We're going to heaven, you're going to hell. What a horrible separation. True spirituality, in my opinion, is open-minded, questioning, what are the fundamental questions, who am I, where do I come from, where am I going, right? What's the purpose of life? These are eternal questions that we all try to answer. Promoting love and viewing all people one human family. You can't possibly leave anybody behind because she's your sister, he's your brother. So this idea that the planet itself is a gift from the cosmos to all of us. We have to share it. We can share it. We can live a good quality of life and save our planet and save humanity if we share. Meditation. I think meditation is good for you. These are the benefits. Overcoming insomnia, depression, mental complexes, Increasing memory, concentration, willpower, self-control, self-esteem and tolerance, and developing mental peace, wisdom, compassion, unconditional love. Are any of you interested in any of these benefits? If so, I think you should meditate. It doesn't cost anything. It's free. The health benefits are also quite impressive now. The meta-studies they do, so 87% for people who meditate, less heart disease, fewer tumors, 50% fewer hospitalizations, less mental disorders and infectious diseases, 
And when you use meditation and therapies, it's very good for chronic pain, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, suicide. You know, if you believe in science, you should try meditation. You should do it, put it in your workplace. It's good. I teach meditation classes to prisons. I always have a captive audience. It's slow, but you know, very good. Um, I teach in Brazil, in Venezuela, in Portugal, other places. I'm always trying to help people, empower people to change their lives. How to meditate? Basically, every system of meditation in the world pretty much agrees on at least four of these five things. Basically, you close your eyes, sit as straight as you can, not moving, right? No input coming into your body or mind. Breathing deeply. Always when you breathe deeply, your mind will slow down. Any time in your life, when you're most tense, most nervous, scared, whatever, take one slow, deep breath and your mind will stop. It will focus. And what do you want to focus on? Yoga says you use a mantra, and it should be the most beautiful idea possible. And finally, you want to practice every day. They all say that. So this is a universal mantra, which means love is all there is. I am a meditation teacher. Would you like to see a demonstration of meditation for three minutes? Mm -hmm. Then you can also do it with me if you like. You can sit in a chair, you can sit on the floor, you can sit anywhere you like. I'm going to sit here. And I'm going to sing for two minutes. And then in two minutes, you can sit in silence. Can the lights be turned lower? Is that yes. possible? Lars, can you just turn off the light? Because sure. that one will turn this big. And I will just, but the whole point of it, remember, <laughs> is to feel love inside, right? You're focusing on the love inside you. You're focusing on the love all around you. And just try to feel that warm, loving, safe,
13th century, there was a mystic poet named Rumi. He asked one time, what is your real work? Why are you here on planet Earth? What's the one thing that you're really here for? As if, he said, the king had sent you to another country to do a very important task. And if you do a thousand other things, but you neglect that one thing, it's as if you've done nothing at all. So Rumi asked, you've come here to planet Earth? Why are you here? What is your real work? For me, that's my real work. I want to make revolution. I want to do it with love. And the second thing, my second conclusion, is follow your bliss. Do your passion. Don't obviously sacrifice your values and your beliefs for money. So, what are your takeaways? Go around the room, do you mind? You can always pass, but can we just ask, what are your takeaways? What are your takeaways? Um, what are your takeaways? more um, mindfully about the value of cooperation. Thank you. you mean take away from the, the talk? Yeah. Well, one thing that I kept thinking throughout is your talk and presentation is very positive. So you're learning about people that are, you know, organizing themselves and taking their lives and putting their own hands and taking care of each other, doing good things. And I think that's very important because in activism, it's often you kind of get into this mode, or at least I do, and I know of others too, where it's very much talking about the bad things, how corrupt the system is, you know, evil. Per, per, how evil, how basically terrible the world is, yeah. you know. And then, you know, I think that it's important to balance the both because if, if things are just so bad and there's no good, well then, it's easy to feel hopeless. But focusing on the examples in your talk, I think it you know, makes me feel hopeful. And it's important to, I think, emphasize that in, you know, in our work as activists. Thank you. And do yoga, too. <laughs> yes. um, I like what you said about moral leadership. I think that's what I like the most. Um, I think that's a very important part of activism. And I take that to mean as like, uh, just show other people love, show other people that that you can be excited about things and uh, try to get other people involved and like just if other people that are in your life um, and if you're excited that makes others excited and so I think that was my favorite part. <laughs> Thank you. My takeaway is uh, that education is very important. Um, but that there's two sides to that. Um, and one of them is educating people and going and learning from other people. Um, but then with all the examples of the cooperatives that, that you mentioned, it seemed that so many of them, uh, their education was through doing. And uh, that they never realized that things were possible. Or that, and so both of those types of education are equally important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think uh, the bottom line should be like helping each other and like really wanting to build a world that you want to see instead of just waiting for it to happen. Um, so I think like the, the idea of like a corporate is that it's like it's starting from the bottom to the top instead of from the top to the bottom. That's how it should be. It's like a more healthy and organic way. Mm -hmm. We just did a film screening last week called Occupy Love. Oh yes. Which I think you would really like. I'm um, sure. I, I think, um, but I, I guess what I'm noticing is that I'm seeing more people connecting inward peace.
use and not more action, and I think that that's going to be a growing trend, mm -hmm. and that's potentially extremely powerful. Uh, uh, living a life balance uh, includes a uh, build an economy that's in balance. It's about progressive spiritual values and right livelihood and all those things. And, and uh, like you said earlier, you know, when, when the world is possible, you know, that's why that's that's kind of putting it all together, you know, balance and growth. I always consider young people anybody younger than 60 now. You know? <laughs> anybody younger than they're young, you know. I just notice that every year it kind of. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, just a, a reminder of what folks have said that I think that the activism becomes more about putting energy toward what we want to build rather than against what we don't want. And because I, I mean, believe for myself that what I put my energy toward is what I make more of. That's what becomes more of. I, I'm doing more of my education for activism now. Put your energy in that direction. And Baba Nam came along. I just, I, I agree, a mantra is good. I need to remember that. Baba Nam, I love that came along. You find a lot on YouTube. <laughs> really, <laughs> not, not like me, but really beautiful music. So, yes. so we're not, you know, uh, to introduce a mantra uh -huh. to younger people, you know, 13, 14, uh -huh. 15 years old, uh, you know, I don't give them any kind of Sanskrit right. mantra. Right, right, right. You know, and I just ask them to, uh, you know, find something that, that, you know, speaks to their heart. And, right. Uh, you know, and repeat it. Right. Uh, to themselves. And, right. Uh, and let them do it. Right, 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 right. Yes. Anything. Any. All of this is obviously making it happen. And I love to meditate with anybody who meditates. I don't care what kind of meditation you do. You know, we're all trying to do the same thing, aren't we? You know, trying to control the mind, right? Trying to focus and trying to feel more love. That's what it's all about, isn't it? So yes. Anyway, that's the end. Other, the best part of the book, by the way, is page eight. Nobody ever looks at it. It's linking more than 70 names acknowledgments. And those examples are the best part of the book. So. Are, are the statistics in there in the book? Are some of the statistics you used to yeah. the slide show? Sure, the sure, book? sure, 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 sure. Basically, it's all from the book. Uh, Venezuela is constantly changing, so not all of that is in the book. Yeah, because. The book is about economic democracy, and while I'm talking, there's a lot of education necessary about what's actually happening in Venezuela. So the cooperatives in Venezuela, they're in the book. But the other stuff about Chavez and all this is less so. We don't have any questions before we close her. No? Okay, well, there's some books and there's some other This is called Sacred Body, Sacred Spirit, which is fantastic about Tantra Yoga Meditation. This is another book about proud, not the 
price thinner, smaller, but really good uh, principles for a balanced economy. So, yes. Yeah. Where do you check out for buying the books? Right over here. And also check the, our website all the time because we sometimes make an exception to open for events to happen. So maybe you want to check the website all the time and see what's happening, even when we're closed here for the three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And if I can add to that, the reason that we are only open four days a week these days is because we're moving to a location five times bigger than this one at the corner of North and Maryland. We hope to open in the early fall. Um, so we've got, we're supposed to be closing here May 18th, and we're going to be going out with a big bang. We're going to have a big party that day. Um, the okay, official yeah. announcement is it's a Saturday. Okay. The official announcement isn't out yet, so don't put it on Facebook, but I'm telling you first, because you're here on a Tuesday night, and that's awesome, um, and then we're going to have five, four months of build out in the space. Um, we had a wonderful, very successful fundraising campaign, but we still need more money, and we are going to be doing lots of um, fundraising events. Robin just gave us 20 bucks, which was awesome of her, and if you want to like match her contribution, I encourage you to do so. Um, and yeah, keep on the website, keep checking what we're up to. Thank you all so much for coming out. And I want to tell also, you that you inspire me very much. It's cooperative. I'm very grateful for your opening tonight. And I'm so glad to have met all of you. You inspire me very much. Thank you. Thank you.